All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. This is Ladies Be Architects latest study group. And this month, we're going to be looking at the bulk API and lock contention, which is an absolutely thrilling subject. And we are absolutely thrilled that so many of you registered. We had about 100 people register. And so far, we've got about 40 people have turned up, which is just fantastic. Um, so there's only 10 slots left. So if you haven't been able to get in, please don't worry. We've posted the live streaming link on onto Twitter so you don't have to feel left out. Um, but thank you for giving up an hour of your time this evening, this afternoon, this morning, whatever time, um, to come and learn with us. Um, before we get started, I want to just shout out to some of our champions. These are people who have achieved certifications in the last month. And we are seeing more and more domain certifications being achieved. Um, and our latest ones this month are Nikki and Bumika, who have both achieved um, the system architects um, credentials. So congratulations to both of them. I know that Nikki and Bumika have worked incredibly hard to get to this stage. Nikki, I know, is actually starting to work towards, uh, set her sights on working towards the actual CTA review board um, soon, which is wonderful to see. So congratulations to them for, um, for reaching that eligibility. Um, the next ones I want to shout out to, because we actually, I had to split these up this month because we've had so many wonderful achievements going on. We've had four PD1 passes this month for Martina, Katrina, Susan and Olivia. So congratulations to all four of you. We're really seeing quite a lot of Platform Developer 1 passes at the moment, which is fabulous way more than we saw about a year ago. So do keep it up. And um, by all means, thank, um, I want to thank Blanca as well for running her um, PD1 group last month, uh, last year um, to help and was just seeing the effects of that study group taking place now with all these PD1 passes every month. So congratulations to the four of them. I also want to shout out to our three integration architecture designer passes this month. So one is Nupur, who works for Make Positive, uh, the lovely Crystal, who we've seen on most months, actually, just blazing her way straight through the exam. So congratulations, Crystal. And a new phase, Maria Chinova. She has also passed integration architecture designers. So congratulations to them. And also an additional shout out to both Nikki and to Natalia, who spent lots of time um, last year putting together some amazing content for our integration architecture candidates. Um, so we hope that we're seeing a lot of that pay off too, especially with so many passes every month. Congratulations. And finally, uh, sorry, not even finally, last but one, we have three development lifecycle passes this month. So that's for Tammy, Michelle and Louise. Congratulations to all three of you for passing that exam. I know it's a particularly tough one, but, um, but experience is the key for this particular one. And then our um, three three more. So Nikki achieved her system architect by taking on the identity and access management design assert. So massive congratulations, Nikki. Well done. Um, we have Jolene, who has passed Community Cloud, and Joanna, who has passed Platform App Developer. Congratulations to all of you. Now, if you have passed an exam and we've missed you, we apologize for that. But um, one of the things that we, we would really encourage you to do is when you pass an exam, let us know. Let us know on Twitter. Let us know primarily through our community group, because if we don't know that you've passed, we can't put you on the list. Um, but we wish you all the very best of luck. And thank you very much for letting us know. Um, so quick, quick talk about what's on at the moment. So we have several different initiatives that we're running at the moment um, and some events as well. So first of all, we have on, on the 13th of February, for those based in London or the UK, we have an evening with Ladies Be Architects, which is a social event. And we've got we're going to have a panel of architects talking. Um, we're going to have a vegan skincare product lady coming to show us um, all the plant-based products that she's um, that she's selling. There'll be some talks about architecture and just a chance to network and get to know other people in London. We don't get to do this very often. And also we don't, most of the time when we do these sorts of events, they tend to be alongside world tour or community events. So this is just something in our own right um, that Blue Wolf have been generous enough to allow us to do and to pay for the food and drink, so thank you. 
Um, we also have an initiative at the moment for practice scenarios. We've had one complete scenario so far. We've got one that's about 80% and just needs a bit of review from some CTAs, but we're always looking for more volunteers um, to write some practice scenarios that we can share with the community and allow people like myself, Susanna, Nikki, Charlie, and Natalia and so on, who are actively working towards the board to, to, to practice and to, to make sure that we're comfortable with the structure of a scenario so that we can set ourselves up for success. Um, we also have a Run Your Own Solutioning event framework, which we published earlier last month, just to allow all of you to take to your own organizations, user groups, and so on, to give you a, a framework for running some group workshops that might help to introduce people to the concept of becoming an architect. So thank you to our lovely model, um, with all of her teddy bears and magic markers there. Um, made a great marketing photo, I have to say. Um, and then we also have a mentoring program. We've matched six women with CTAs. Um, and these are all volunteers from a variety of backgrounds. A couple of them are from Salesforce, a couple of them are from partners. And they have graciously taken on six women um, for three months to do some mentoring. So that could include practice. It's basically defined uh, by, by, by each, each pair. They decide how best to orchestrate that. And so far, things are looking quite good. I think no news is good news, but we'll see. Um, but if, you, if that's something that you want to take part in, or if you're a CTA and you want to volunteer some time um, to help somebody, if you work for Salesforce, it will count towards your, um, your volunteering hours. If you don't work for Salesforce, maybe you could persuade somebody to let it count towards your volunteering hours. It's a very worthy uh, initiative. And then recently, we had um, Susanna and Charlie were kind enough to get on a plane and travel to Phoenix, where they ran our solution design workshop at Cactus Force. And this is the team of people who all took part um, in, in, in the solution design workshop. And then the following week, we, went, we, we did it at the London Admin User Groups as well. So lots of learnings came out from that. But every, I, I think everybody here looks like they had a really good time. So thank you to everybody who went. If you have any feedback for us, um, we're always looking to improve the framework and the instructions. So if you have any feedback at all, please don't, please don't hesitate to share it with us. And thank you very much for coming along and taking part. Um, we also have 100 days of trailhead. So since January the 1st, 2019, we paired up with WitDevs and Amplify to run a 100 days of trailhead initiative. And we started allowing people to opt in to a leaderboard. Um, we've got two certification vouchers that Salesforce have very kindly donated to us um, to give to the top two people in this leaderboard who achieved the most points. Since we started, we've got nearly 3,000 badges you guys have got, over 1.8 million points, and 19 certifications. It's absolutely phenomenal. And in the lead at the moment is Vicky Jeffrey from Australia, who's got 68,000 points since Oof. the 1st of January. So if you want to take part in that, um, you can always opt in. Or anything that you've achieved on Trailhead since the 1st of January will count towards this leaderboard as long as as long as you've joined before the 100 days is over in April. Um, so please do get in touch if you'd like to take part in that. And congratulations to Vicky. Um, I'm sure she's got plenty of people hot on her heels um, to, to take the, the top spot. Um, and finally, we have to just give a shout out to Natalia, who finished her identity and access management study group in uh, just before Christmas. She donated nearly 38 hours of her time towards um, towards uh, last year, towards integration. And then this year, you can access um, hours of content that will help you get ready for this exam. Um, thank you again to Natalia for donating her time. And if any of you would like to run another study group um, and you would like our support and, our, and us to promote you, we are more than happy to assist you with that. Um, the content is posted on our just gonna website, point. And we also have it on our YouTube channel as well. Um, it's On our website, it's, it's actually the YouTube video is just embedded. And just a plug for, yeah, this, there's so much content on YouTube for all of the exams, and it's actually um, organized really nicely around each exam, so you can, like, autoplay. It's, something, it's more than 10 hours. It's something like, I don't know, like, probably closer to 20 hours of content and just play it on auto and, you know, 
definitely soak up all that learning and you can even download it if you have the YouTube app. So it's, uh, we can post the YouTube, uh, YouTube link in the chat. I'll do that yeah. during the session. Yeah. And it's, it's just ladies be architects as well. Um, thank you, Susanna. So this, so thank you to everybody as well for voting for the certification. Every month we do these and every month they are voted on democratically. Um, so if you're not part of the trailhead, uh, trailblazer community, group we can't collect your vote so do come and um, join our group and that'll give you a chance to have a say on what we cover every month so the group chose to do data architecture then we posted four different topics and then the next and the topic that you selected was the bulk api and lock contention so without further ado i am going to um, give out a special thank you to our guest speaker emily patra and she is also a Salesforce certified technical architect, and she has very kindly agreed to take to spend 45 minutes just taking us through the content for this particular topic. So I'm going to hand you, uh, uh, Emily, do you want to take over from here and just tell me when to go to the next slide? Yes, thank you, Gemma. Thank um, you. So hello, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I am delighted to be here. Uh, with Gemma and team, uh, Ladies Be Architect, just a shout out to you. You're doing a fantastic job. Uh, it's not just women, uh, it's it's men. Uh, I see colleagues accessing your content every day. Uh, and I think that there's some fabulous stuff out there in, in terms of prep for CTA. I must say when I started preparing for CTA, I wish I had you, uh, you know, uh, and, and I wish you were so popular at, at that point uh, when I started. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm here. So I'm Emily Patra. I work for Salesforce um, Strategic Advisory Division specifically. I uh, passed my CTA last year, and uh, I'm so glad I did. Uh, and I'm, I'm, again, very glad to be here and happy to help in, in any way I can with this uh, brilliant community and all the aspiring CTAs out there. So uh, a little bit about me, uh, as I said, I work for Salesforce. Um, I'm a mother, so I have a seven-year-old son. Uh, so busy life. Um, I love traveling, I love exploring, and thankfully uh, my work profile does give me a lot of opportunities to travel. Uh, fun fact about me, last year I was on a program, uh, I was on a global rollout program, and I did 22 countries in, in nine months. So it, it was quite, I mean, it was maybe one day or two day trips, but I did, you know, um, checkbox a lot of the countries on the list. and. Um, Actually, funnily, I was in Russia uh, during the World Cup, so that was great. It was an experience, um, and it was all work-related travel, and I can swear I didn't plan it to be like that, but I just happened to be there during the World Cup. So, uh, yeah, so that's something about me. Um, next slide, Gemma. So as Gemma said, uh, we are talking about bulk API and log contention today. So I'm going to get, stay very narrowly focused on this topic. Uh, but data management and architecture is a, a wide topic and uh, dealing with large data volumes has many aspects to it. I'm not going to cover everything. I, I can't in 40 minutes. Uh, so yes, this topic is going to be very focused on, on bulk API, uh, log contention, and also my focus area will be from um, a very CTA review board perspective, what you need to know, uh, how you need to answer questions in your certs and exams and uh, very scenario based as well. Um, so I'm not going to go into you know deep down uh, details of how to write your clients and how to call the API, but uh, I'm really going to focus on the architecture of it and, and the best practices. So that's on the agenda. Introduction to Belk APIs, how do they work, uh, what are the modes, and then we'll talk about the concepts of parallel processing, uh, what is a log contention, and then how do we log avoid log contention. And listen carefully, because at the end of this, um, I have a few questions and, and a little quiz for you to uh, work on. Right, next slide, please. So uh, before we deep dive into bulk API, um, let's let's talk about a bit of context uh, around why do we need bulk APIs at all. So welcome to the world of large data volumes. And I'm sure most of us work on 
enterprise um, organizations. And by enterprise organizations, I mean huge organizations with a lot of legacy and a lot of data um, and you know uh, millions, we're talking about millions and billions of data to be processed uh, using Salesforce. And the first thing to remember when you're going for a CTA board is, what do, when do you identify a large data volume? So maybe 15 years ago, it, it would have been one million, you know, when you 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 were trying to integrate to do a, a batch process, but now uh, in Salesforce terms, I would say as a benchmark, anything above tens and millions, tens millions of rows, um, is treated as a large data volume, even though it might not be uh, a big problem because of the architecture. Uh, but still, from a CTA review board perspective, every time you see that you know number and upwards, always treat uh, it as an aspect to be considered in your solution architecture and in your answers. Um, why do we need to worry about it? Because we need to worry about enterprise level data migrations uh, during go live. Uh, we all need to worry about batch data processing. We need to worry about integration between different um, systems and, and transfer of you know millions of data across systems. And we need an efficient way to do it because we, we don't want a batch to be running for 48 hours. It's just not uh, efficient. So to deal with all of these use cases, Salesforce then uh, came up with an API which is focused on dealing with large data volume, which is the bulk API. So next slide, please, Gemma. So, so what is a bulk API? Uh, as I said, it's a programmatic option uh, from Salesforce to load large data into an org and at speed. It's optimized for loading and deleting large data volume data. It is based on REST principles and uh, it allows you to query, insert, update, absurd, and delete records. So those are the actions you can perform with a bulk API. Uh, it can run in two modes. It can run in serial and parallel mode, and we're going to talk about both later on. Uh, and it's asynchronous processing. So it's, it's not a synchronous process. And again, we'll talk about this when we dig a bit deeper. Next one, please. So how does bulk API work? now? You have a client, and I said it's a programmatic uh, way of calling, uh, you know, loading your data. So you could write a Java program to then call bulk API in Salesforce. And the first thing, it, it the concept of a bulk API, the way it works in Salesforce, it, there's a concept of a job. So you create a job in Salesforce, and the job is basically uh, informs what action needs to be performed um, on, on what objects. And then you create batches within that job. And the batches is literally where you've broken down all your um, data into small pieces or chunks of files that Salesforce can then process uh, asynchronously and hopefully in parallel mode. Uh, so then your client can create jobs. And these jobs basically get added to a Salesforce queue. Uh, they're not picked up by Salesforce servers or, uh, you know, process heads immediately. So that's why it's an asynchronous process. Now, as you know, Salesforce is a multi-tenant architecture. So by multi-tenant, uh, I'm sure you all know, you know, there are multiple customers and multiple orgs sitting on a single server of Salesforce. And it has got a finite number of worker threads. So worker threads are basically, uh, you know, dedicated threads that can pick up a job and then process it. So based on you know, the capacity of the data center and the servers, it's got a finite number of worker threads, which can then work on uh, processing these records. So Salesforce builds up a queue. You go and add to the queue. Uh, Salesforce will pick up each batch uh, as and when the capacity becomes available, and hence it's asynchronous. There's no guarantees. Uh, of the sequence in which these batches will get picked up and processed. So make sure that you know the way you architect your uh, batches and your jobs, you don't architect it to be synchronous because there's uh, or in a sequence because there are no guarantees of that sequence. Um, what else can you do? You could uh, check the status of the jobs and batches which you've then queued up to see you know which one is processing, which one is completed. And then you can retrieve results at the end of each process. Um, and that, then the results will tell you how many records have been processed successfully or not. Uh, yeah, you can go on to the next uh, slide. 
so that's uh, you can also monitor all of these jobs and all of these batches uh, via the Salesforce UI itself. So you can monitor bulk uh, data jo uh, load jobs, as you can see on the screenshot, which can tell you which ones are in progress and which ones are completed. And by clicking on those uh, job ID hyperlinks there, uh, you can then get the details of what happened to the job, how much time it took, uh, how many records errored out, and how many were processed successfully, et cetera. So that's how our bulk API works. Now, the next slide, please. Now, we spoke about the bulk API uh, working in two modes, which are serial and parallel. So a serial mode is obviously where, you know, a batch is picked up after the first batch finishes, and then it kind of runs uh, in that order. So if we were going to, say, load 20 million records in, in Salesforce, uh, it would take a certain amount of time, say an hour, to do it. Uh, whereas in parallel mode, if architected well, and in an ideal case scenario, uh, it should look like that. If, if we break up that 20 million into batches of four, you know, um, and our jobs or four jobs, um, then it should take less amount of time. And uh, it, it should basically make up uh, process and loading quicker and faster and more efficient uh, and hence optimized. So ideally, the idea of having bulk API is to run it in parallel mode. And that's, and that's how it is optimized. Uh, serial mode is not recommended for large data volumes. But there are use cases in which we will use serial mode uh, bulk APIs. And I'll talk about one of them uh, later in the slides. But uh, yeah, the idea of parallel mode is to optimize data loads, to have multiple threads working on the job and you know processing batches in parallel. Uh, serial mode is, again, you know um, basically sequential pickup of batches. Next slide, please. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're just going to, when we talk about serial parallel modes um, and, and all the concepts um, later, we'll use this use case of accounts and orders. And we are saying that accounts and orders are in a you know, lookup relationship. Uh, they're related to each other. We're going to uh, load a high volume of orders for a certain number of accounts um, and, and see how it behaves in different scenarios uh, as we go through the use case. Uh, next, please. So before we uh, dive deep into uh, you know serial and and parallel processing, we have to talk about two key concepts. I mean, there are uh, a few keywords in there which uh, come up regularly, and these two come up very regularly. One is um, the degree of parallelism, and the other is throughput. Now, a degree of parallelism by definition is what's on the right hand side on the slide is the amount of work completed as a duration um, divided by the actual amount of time it took to complete that work. So I've got a example out here to explain exactly how that formula works. So if, for example, you have an integration job that inserts about 100,000 records in five minutes, and you know your job took five minutes, uh, you had divided your job into you know batch sizes of 10,000 records each uh, so that you had a total of 10 batches and for simplicity's sake let's say that you know Salesforce took a minute to process each of those batches uh, so if it took a minute to process each of those batches uh, but your job completed in five minutes that means five minutes worth of work uh, sorry 10 minutes worth of work was done in five minutes by uh, you know processing them in parallel and hence, your degree of parallelism for that bulk API job is two in this case. If it was in serial mode, where you have 10 batches and each takes one minute, but each batch gets picked up one after the other, it would have taken 10 minutes to do that, uh, to complete that job. And in that case, the, uh, the degree of parallelism you would have achieved in a serial mode uh, bulk API uh, would have been one. The important thing to remember is, uh, in a serial mode, the best degree of parallelism you can achieve is one, so it's, it's limited. The idea of um, having parallel mode in there is to increase this degree of parallelism as you go, and to architect your, uh, your load in such a way that you can achieve the 
maximum degree of parallelism and there's no number there because it depends on your server capacity, the load on that specific data center at that specific point, um, and also you know what kind of locking is happening, what kind of lock contention is happening, etc. So there are a lot of factors which impact your degree of parallelism, and this is a very um, you know textbook theoretical calculation. In there, you will never achieve these results uh, the way I've described it, but it, it is the simplest way to really understand what degree of parallelism is and why you should look to uh, maximize it. And if you have no option, and if, if your degree of parallelism is less than one with parallel load, then go for a serial load is yeah, you know the, the takeaway here. Uh, next concept I want to talk about is two, throughput. So throughput is simple. It's the records processed per second. So it's a measure of performance. How many records did you get through? in a given number of time. And usually the degree of parallelism has a direct impact on throughput. Um, so it should increase your throughput if you've architected uh, your data load well enough. Next slide, please. So now we are going to talk about uh, parallel processing. Now, we're not going to talk about serial processing because um, serial processing is just like any other integration load or any other API that you must have used. But uh, parallel processing is what is really the strength, strength of bulk API. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Now, if architected right, it can increase throughput, uh, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, it can, even if you process data in parallel and you've calculated um, a certain degree of parallelism in theory, you might not achieve it. And that's an important thing to remember because, as I said, there are other factors which impact this number. So even though, you know, theoretically, if you've said, oh, I've divided it up into, you know, 10 batches, uh, it should take this amount of time and all the 10 will run in parallel. So ideally, I would half the, you know, time taken. It, it doesn't work like that because your batches, all your batches might not run in parallel all your batches might not get picked up at the same time. Uh, you know, your batches might be competing for uh, locks on similar records that can slow it down. Your batch might run, but you might not get successful records in Salesforce and you might have loads of failed records again. So there are loads of problems which can happen uh, while parallel processing. And the idea is to be aware of what could go wrong and be aware of best practices and architect and prepare your data and your data model and your architecture in such a way so that they all work in conjunction uh, to give you the maximum processing power that you can get out of a Salesforce server. Uh, so that's why that, that second point, you know, that it can produce unexpected degree of parallelism. So be prepared for it. Um, locks are the big topic again. Uh, and locks can cause a lot of wasted processing time because there are tries and retries and i'll talk about how locks work in a moment uh, they can cause failures so you might have a job run in parallel which does not load 50 percent of the data that means actually you've done worse than a serial load uh, because of locks and then it can reduce throughput if if it's uh, causing a lot of errors next eight, uh, slide please so that brings us on to the topic of uh, what is lock contention. So if you consider the use case that we were talking about that we, you know, you have an account and you have an order, uh, which are linked by a lookup in a one to many relationship. Uh, that green box down there is a job that you've created in Salesforce with a lot of batches in it. And the batch data, the CSV files basically contain order data related to various accounts. Now, if you see on the slide, uh, the first CSV file has two orders related to the same account, account one. And then the second CSV file has another two orders which are related to the same account as the first one um, in the first CSV, which is account one. So what's happened here is we've created this job. We've set the concurrency mode of the bulk API to parallel and we've run the job and ideally all these files should get processed in parallel and we should get a fantastic output and a perfect performance but it doesn't and the reason it doesn't is that 
uh, of the SLOC contention. So if these two files get picked up in parallel, the, when the first batch, and these are two different batches uh, running in the same job, the first batch is trying to update or create orders for account one, and hence it acquires a lock on that record in the account object. The second batch, which is now being run in parallel, also wants to update the order information for account one. And it's trying to get a lock on account one in the account object. But because it's running in parallel and that uh, record is already locked, uh, this batch is failing these records because it cannot acquire that lock on the same object. And because it's failing and there's a retry mechanism, it, it retries and hence it is wasting uh, your processing time and your processing power, hence decreasing throughput um, in this case. So this is typically how locks ha happen. Again, a very simple example, but normally any related record that we're trying to update uh, in these kind of cases, especially lookups, master detail relationships, uh, will cause lock contention because for the sake of data integrity, Salesforce uh, or any database for that matter, will lock data that, with referential integrity. And it will at, it will try and you know log data, update the child records, and then release the lock for the next uh, batch and process to come and acquire lock again. So in this case, there's high probability that uh, the lock contention will cause this process to error out, and at the end of it, you will have loads of error records which have not been loaded, and the error you'll normally see is due to lock contention. Uh, next slide, please. So what causes lock contention? Now, this is one use case that I described. So, uh, you know, referential integrity uh, data when related to each other uh, cause lock contention, uh, typically in a master detail relationship in uh, certain types of lookup relationships. So if, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about how we can um, reduce lock contention and lookup relationship by not locking down the parent record uh, via a Salesforce config. So that's part of the um, remedial action. Uh, Roll-up summary fields can cause lock contention. So if you if you have a master record uh, with a roll-up summary field and you're trying to update child records on that summary field, uh, it will try and lock the master. And if your records are uh, you know, spread, spread across multiple batches, again, it could cause a lock contention in there. Triggers could cause lock contention. If, if your triggers are firing while you're um, loading or updating data, uh, workflows, if, if your workflows, uh, if you have workflows or process flows firing up during your loads, uh, you know, they can cause lock contention because they might have processes uh, that need to, again, go and block certain data that you're trying to uh, load or update as part of your batch data load. And that causes a conflict um, and, and hence your lock contention. Group memberships, a very important one. Whenever you are trying to update, especially users who are in roles or in a role hierarchy, uh, Salesforce normally places an organization-wide uh, group membership lock. And when it places, um, basically the idea is to uh, you know preserve the uh, organization-wide uh, you know, data integrity and security. And hence, uh, you know, there's an organization-wide group membership lock with Salesforce um, users to update any users on, in a role or any changes to the role hierarchy, et cetera. Uh, so this is something to be aware of. And because this is normally an organization-wide lock, uh, a best practice is to use Bulk API in serial mode, especially when you're trying to insert group members or users who are assigned to roles. And this is one of those exception cases in which uh, bulk API does not perform well um, in parallel mode because you might have a lot of uh, locking errors in this scenario. Overlapping runs, uh, again, if you have a, a batch process which has overrun, uh, say you, you run something every hour and your first batch process is still running, and your second uh, scheduled batch process starts running at the same time and starts updating or, or referring to the same amount of uh, same data, same object, same rows, uh, that, that might cause uh, lock contention. 
but that also spells out that the architecture is not optimized enough uh, and it, it shouldn't be happening that between your you know um, schedule runs your batch processes have overrun so it's it's either you've scheduled it wrongly and you've estimated your uh, you know loads um, in it to be wrong and that's why they're overrunning or there's a problem and it's a one-off and in that case again you, you need to uh, investigate why next uh, next slide please so uh, strategies for resolving log contention now one of them is uh, from a look looker point of view as I said there's something on a config so you can tweak the data model uh, to work in your favor so there is a config it there especially for lookup records which says don't allow deletion of the lookup record that's part of the lookup relationship and it's a checkbox on your uh, relationship definition in Salesforce now if you uncheck this uh, and that means you're basically telling Salesforce not to lock the parent record when the child record is being deleted and this helps with lock contention especially if you're loading a lot of records uh, where you have a child's queue or you have a parent-child relationship and you know this is going to be a problem but only uncheck this if that you know falls in line with your data integrity uh, requirements because if you think this is going to be a problem and you definitely don't want you know parents uh, to be changed uh, irrespective of the what's happening to the child records uh, keep it on because there are other ways of dealing with lock con contention the second one is the, the the use case that we discussed earlier is why were the you know records locked in the first place so we've used the same analogy there but if you uh, the slight difference there is if you if you notice my csv files uh, down there you you see that i've now ordered the csv files and i have sorted them by the parent id which is account 1 account 2 account 3 uh, by doing that, what do I achieve? So I have all the order records for account one now in a single batch. So that means when this batch acquires and lock uh, on the account, it can process all the child records because it's in the same batch. And hence, because the next batch is not trying to update the child records for account one at the same time that the first batch is, uh, they're not competing for the lock on the same record. So this sort of sorting by parent ID and you know ordering records and creating smart batches in a job uh, can go a long way in dealing with lock contention and in this case uh, it actually causes no lock contention because uh, we're not ideally repeating uh, the parent ID in any of the batches uh, in there for parallel runs and, and this is one of the key methods in there that to program your uh, creation of batches, creation of jobs in such a way that you minimize lock contention, especially in a parent-child scenario, scenario like this. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the other strategies for resolving uh, lock contention in here are control feeds and chunking of data. So you might feel at some point that, um, okay, that's easy. Let's have one batch per job. Let's create more jobs. And hence each, you know, uh, the batches won't be picked up in parallel and, you know, there, there won't be a lock contention. Uh, it's not necessarily the best of the strategies uh, out there because the idea is to maximize parallel processing out there. And also remember that when Salesforce picks up a job, it, allocates all its or you know a certain algorithm is used to decide how many threads uh, of you know workers is it going to assign to this job and a good number a good reference number to have there is have at least 20 batches in the queue for Salesforce to pick up in parallel uh, and that's because if you don't and Salesforce picks up a job and you only have two batches there in there that means it will finish this job first and it will only process two batches. And if it has 18 worker queues available, those 18 worker queues are not working for your job at that point. So you're then reducing your degree of parallelism because Salesforce might or might not pick up your next job uh, before it finishes this one. So the idea is to uh, keep sufficient number of batches in your jobs so that you're maximizing the uses of that uh, usage of that parallel processing in Salesforce. 
um, but also have smart batches so that you know the, the batches aren't competing with each other basically by causing block contention. Uh, so the first thing is avoid a low controlled feed um, if possible. Don't you know granularize your jobs in such a way so that you're not utilizing the power of parallel. You know you don't have one batch per job and then create ten jobs in there. It's it's not helping with the processing. It it might even be slower than your serial processing in this case. Uh, reduce the number of jobs and increase the number of batches. And this is you know in in principle with we want to maximize the number of available worker threads to us. And to maximize that number of available worker threads, you have to keep enough in the pipeline so that when a worker thread becomes available, it can pick up your batches and start processing them in parallel. And as I said, that's just a referential number, 20 batches in a queue to optimize the usage of threads. Now, control feeds are sometimes a good thing. So you could have a more hybrid approach in there to say, if you've got a really, really large you know, um, data volume to load, uh, you could do control feeds, uh, you know, in conjunction with your parent ID sorting, your, um, you know, referential data integrity, et cetera. So combine all of that strategy to then have control feeds where, you know, you chunk up jobs, but make sure that your jobs are not underutilized and they don't have an underrepresentation of batches and data to process because, uh, that is like wasted processing power in there, and, and you're not using the uh, power of parallel processing. Uh, the next strategy is disable validation rules, triggers, and workflows while loading data. And this is an important one, because uh, what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be triggering off uh, you know, a different set of processing on the same data uh, while you're still loading data. And this will again cause lock contention, and especially things like workflows and triggers. If, if they have to do certain things on the data that you're loading, you would rather have your data loaded first and then do this in a retrospect. Um, in most cases, validation rules, in some cases they can't be disabled because you, know, you just have to have them there. Uh, in, some, in most cases, you can probably pre-validate, pre-clean your data. And that's, again, very important, especially in data loading kind of scenarios where you're doing data migration, where you prepare the data, you clean the data in advance. And when you're cleaning and preparing and transforming the data, you would want to apply most of your validation rules at that point. And you could have a separate batch process at that point in Salesforce then, if you've disabled your validation rules, to say, after you've loaded this data, I'm going to run this uh, on the lo loaded data to validate whether they, it still meets my validation rule. And it's one of the you know techniques where if you're loading massive amounts of data, validation rules are slowing you down and slowing your load down. Uh, disable them and have the same logic perform in an after uh, batch program. So it, it runs on the same data, it, it performs the same validation, but just as a batch apex, rather than you know a validation rule at that point in time while you're loading data runtime. Uh, so this is one of the strategies used for uh, data migration, and this is a very common one. And, and the same strategy goes for triggers, workflows as well. So avoid runtime processing. Try and do one thing at a time, and uh, that will maximize your load performance, but also help you, you know, maintain the integrity of your data. Uh, look out for roll-up uh, roll summary fields. I think I touched upon it very um, lightly before. Uh, so if you have roll-up summary fields and you're trying to, uh, you know, update child records which roll up to that summary field, uh, it can cause lock contention. Uh, workaround for this is use summary reporting if possible at that point. Uh, really evaluate that do you need that roll up at that point or not? Can you use a summary report which you can run after you've loaded the data? Still gives you the same results, but does not cause lock contention, does not cause problem with your um, volumes of data loading. And then uh, defer sharing rule calculations for Mars group membership changes. Now, this is a very important one, again, especially if you're trying to update uh, users and, and roles and group memberships. Um, because sharing rules, uh, as you know, every time someone changes a role and or you know 
a sharing rule is changed, there are sharing rule recalculations which trigger in Salesforce. And then these go and lock all the group membership tables um, and they, they cause lock contention for all your other records which are coming in. So by deferring these sharing calculations to a later point in time, you can do mass group updates first and then trigger the you know sharing calculations later uh, so that or, you know, one, it maintains your data integrity, and then um, it also helps your uh, speed of loading. So those are some of the strategies for um, resolving log contention. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Right, okay, so uh, that was really a high level touch point on what is log contention, the best strategies and best practices to avoid it, uh, how to maximize parallel roads, how to use bulk data API. I've got a small quiz out here, uh, which is based on whatever I've said so far. And we'll quickly run through this. I, I think you can post your answers on the chat. Uh, I'm probably going to give it like a 15, 20 second break between each of these questions. Um, and then at the end of it, I'm happy to take any questions with whatever time we've got left. The first on, uh, question, um, wow, I'm already seeing answer, answers out there. <laughs> <laughs> Bulk API is based on. Rest, yeah. Rest, yay. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think we know what the first one is. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next one. Bulk APIs can be run in the following mode. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I will wait for hey, everyone's so clever. <laughs> I know. My answers are quite obvious there. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. I think. Oh, B. I was going to say B. Isn't it lightning and classic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Someone said E. I, I would like to know what that option is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. So this is LBA Corp. Ladies B Architects <laughs> Corporation. Yeah. Uh, wants to load and update uh, details of 60,000 users to their org, uh, each having a role in a well-defined role hierarchy. What would you recommend for this integration? Uh, so there's a lot of Bs there, which is great. So we'll wait for another. Anyone who thinks it's a C? I wondered about that, but then you mentioned about the group membership tables. Yeah. Okay. And, and someone said A could work as well, and I agree. Uh, a could work as well, but it's not the optimal solution. And probably for 60,000, yeah, but if it's, you know, much larger than that, if you're dealing with a higher volume of data, uh, using a SOAP API. Uh, In my org, it would be D. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, that would be painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so as I said, SOAP API would work, but it's not optimal, and especially when you're doing it as a batch uh, with much larger volumes of data. Serial mode because of uh, the org-wide um, you know, group membership table log. Um, so yeah, in this case, it's serial mode. If it was anything else, uh, it would probably be parallel mode. Okay, next question. Validation rules, workflow rules, and triggers speed up large data volume, slow down processing, has no impact or should be built into loading scripts. Okay, lots of these. We've got a very smart audience here. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got the answer right. <laughs> yeah, a few cheeky ones in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. D, 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 D. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, Gemma. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, right, so I, I would be very intrigued to see what your degree of parallelism comes out in there. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, ideally, you can't, but you know, you can build validation into Java and your client side scripts. Someone asked me if you can build these into loading scripts uh, or not. So, uh, yeah, do we have any more questions? The next one. 
please. So was it? It was B. Oh, uh, it was B. Yeah, it was. Uh, it obviously slows down processing of uh, large data volumes because these uh, validation rules, workflows, and triggers would fire off for each record as and when they are updated or used, um, loaded, and as they meet the criteria. And hence, they'll have locks on these records. And hence, all the other batches trying to access these records will either face lock contention or because these validation rules in turn will try to uh, update or do more processing there, it, it will slow down your data loading. So yeah, the answer is B. Thank you. Uh, OK, so this question. Again, LBA Corp uh, wants to load 10 million opportunities which are related to 200,000 accounts. Uh, they use bulk API in parallel mode, but the jobs are slow and have lots of fail records with locking errors. So what is the best course of action that you can take in this case? So some have said B, B, C, and D. OK. <laughs> oh, <redundant. laughs> so V and D. Yeah, so the answer is D. Uh, and D is basically B and C. So there are the two things which can resolve lock contention in this case. So order the opportunities into batches by account ID. So you know one of my previous slides where I ordered the CSV files to have all the child records related to a single parent record in one batch, so that the parallel batches are not contending for the same lock on the same record. And the second one is to disable validation rules, workflows, and triggers because these might be causing lock contention errors or they just simply might be slowing down the process in this case. So well done, everyone. It's a D. Next one, please. OK, so I think we've only got five minutes remaining, so happy to take any questions if there are. So either people understood everything or they understood nothing. <laughs> <laughs> They're all booked in to go all in front of the board tomorrow then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Question from Rowan. OK. Is there a difference in efficiency in disabling validation rules, et cetera, by referencing an excluded user versus disabling them directly? OK, I'm trying to understand this question. So I guess what you're asking is if we disable validation rule, which is referencing an excluded user? So the way I read that is mm. that if you put in your validation rule, only run if you're this yeah. user. Yeah. Certainly. Oh, OK, right. Yeah. Like exclude so, API user or something. Yeah. I mean, no, there's no efficiency um, impact in that case. If, I mean, you, if your user is not included in the processing and your validation rule only impacts that users, the, the, the validation rule will not fire. Uh, the impact on performance is only when uh, your validation rule or your workflow rule fires for, for the records that you're processing. And that's where there will be an impact on the loading. So in this case, uh, there would be no impact. So is the bulk API limited to data loading, or can you use it programmatically in place of batch Apex? Uh, this is from uh, Mike D. Maria. Uh, so Mike, uh, no, it's not limited to data loading. You could use it as a, a nightly batch interface. Um, you could use it to run your regular integrations and interfaces. You could even use it for querying record. So I think in one of my uh, initial slides, um, I listed a number of operations that the uh, bulk API can do, uh, which is query, insert, delete records, uh, upsert records, and update records. And any of that could be uh, run programmatically as an interface. OK, uh, next question is from Wrinkle. Like, if we can use a flag in labels to disable the execution of the validation rules, Will that impact the performance? If you can use a flag in labels to disable the execution of validation rules. Yeah, so for okay. example, you have a custom setting. 
Hmm. Well, yeah, uh, the idea is your validation rule will still be evaluated for that flag and then probably not run. So you're still, uh, you know, though you're not running the actual validation rule, so potentially reducing the impact, uh, but your validation rule will probably still get evaluated or your flag will still get evaluated. And with very large data volumes, what you want is uh, you want to focus on that load or on that update um, and, and basically maximize your processing in that. Uh, and all the business logic can then, then be done separately as a separate batch. Uh, so in this case, I would still say disable validation rules completely uh, for, for the best performance. And there was a question from Andrew Brandt as well, a bit further up. Okay. Uh, you talked quite a lot about post-processing, but it seems like pre-processing the data before load might be better. Yes, absolutely, Andrew. And I spoke about both. So pre-processing, uh, as I said, if you're, say, doing a, a, a data load, during your ETL, if you incorporate most of your validation logic, most of your data cleaning, your transformation is you know nice and, and clean. You've ordered your batches well. You've sorted your records into uh, batches to avoid lock contention. That's the best mechanism. Completely agree with you. Uh, Post-processing uh, is, again, um, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, it's 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 not competing with pre-processing. They, they have different use cases. So you could have the best uh, you know, uh, pre-processing in there with uh, all your validation rules done, build, everything. But you still might want to do a post-processing for checking that your validation rules are still valid against the data or other referential data, which is already on your org or pre-exists on your org or might have changed on your org. Uh, while you were doing your ETL somewhere else in a staging database. So they can, they should be used in conjunction and the heavy lifting, if possible, should be done by pre-processing, but post-processing is still important, uh, especially for checking that, you know, uh, more like a reassurance of what, what you've loaded and whether uh, the results are as expected. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to say a, a very extra special thank you to Emily. I know I learned a lot from that lesson, uh, from that session today, and a few extra um, elements to the um, knowledge gained from the data architecture was obviously that came right through from all the experience that you've got. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, if you wanted to um, take a look into more resources, there's obviously the, and you're looking at doing the data architecture exam um, or the CTA for that matter. Um, it never, never, it's never a crime to go through everything all over again if you need to, um, but there is the exam guide. Um, Trailhead team have put a trail mix together to help you um, work for this exam. And there are various blogs out there as well that can help support this. And of course there's nothing more um, there's nothing teach that teaches you more than actually a practice and getting involved in projects with large data volumes so that you can actually experience this firsthand, um, which is very clear from Emily's um, presentation that she actually has. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing that. Um, and again, thank you very much to everybody for coming. Um, please come and join us in our community group. We've got resources on our website, which is all organized by certification, um, and also YouTube. Basically, everything that we put onto YouTube, we we, base, we we show on the website anyway as an embedded video. And as Susanna said, it's all organized by cert as well. So do feel free to do that. If you have feedback, comments, questions, you can always message us on Twitter or leave a message on our um, Trailblazer community. And if this, if you would like to get involved and run a study group for us one month, or you'd like to run a, a serial, a series of different groups, then um, please, by all means, get involved. We've got um, three and three people have actually done it already. So, so um, thank you to those people. 
Um, tell us your story. If we're helping you in some way, or if you like what we're doing, or even if you're a CTA and you want to share your experiences of, be, of, of that journey, then we would love to feature you on our blog. Um, please let me know if you would like to be featured and I'll send you the questions. Um, we actually have our current feature at the moment features Emily herself, which tells her story about how she felt when she became a CTA, hence the jumping around on the beach, um, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to being able to do my oh, Actually, it was in the desert, not a beach. <laughs> <laughs> Was it an English beach? <laughs> oh, it was a Middle Eastern desert, oh, <laughs> the Arabian oh, okay. desert. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, of course, we've got a few community conferences, user groups coming up um, that you more that we'd love to see you at, and uh, come be a guest on our podcast. We've got a few people that we want to interview. Um, if you'd like to get involved in that, please get in touch. And I think that is it. So I will let you all go back to your afternoon or your evening. Thank you so much, Emily, again, for giving up your valuable time to come and show us this. Thank you um, very much. Yeah, excellent. Uh, take care, everybody, and looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.